Welcome to today's episode of the Hot and Steamy podcast. We'd like to first recognize our sponsors, Kelly Garza of Steamy Chick and Kimberly Ann Johnson of MAGA Mamas. Follow them on Instagram at Steamy Chick and at MAGA Mamas. Hot, steamy, hot, hot, steamy, hot. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Hot and Steamy Podcast. I'm Jale. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> sorry, I was still, uh, I was still in awe of that theme song. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Today, we're very excited to have Dr. Lorena White with us. Mm-hmm. That's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Let me give you a brief introduction to the fabulous Dr. Lorena White. Uh, Dr. White has over 20 years of of service and experience in the field of women's health, raging, raging, ranging from birth doula to obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, including acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine. She works closely with a carefully designed team formed especially to deliver expert care to women experiencing complex health challenges such as uterine fibroids, PCOS, endometriosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and fibromyalgia. She and this illustrious team not only treat women, but also couples who are experiencing fertility challenges and are trying to conceive. Together with the team, Dr. White facilitates the transformation of complex women's health and fertility challenges by helping women and couples address the underlying root cause of their respective conditions. Using purpose-built signature programs that are unique to the Eudaimonia Center, her patients and clientele begin to flourish without taking unnecessary pharmaceutical medications and synthetic hormones, or having fruitlessly invasive surgical procedures. Dr. White integrated her practice by forming a synergistic marriage between allopathic and traditional Chinese medicine treatment modalities in order to bridge the gaps in women's health care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Every word, <laughs> every word. Did I pronounce you the Modia Center right? Everything, the U is pronounced as a V, so it's evdemonia. It's a Greek word, and it means human flourishing. Evdemonia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anything that wasn't in the bio that you want us to know about you? Um, nothing in particular. However, if there's anything that you either of you would like to ask, please, please feel free to do so. <laughs> okay. Um, will you tell us where the center is located? The center is located in Columbia, Maryland. It's um, a suburb of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then how many patients do you usually take? Like, is there a waiting list or can people usually just come through? Um, We have a waiting list and that waiting list is pretty much just for that first appointment, um, like your first preference. Um, But I'd say over the course of a day or over the course of a week, We see between 10 to 12 people a day. So we're looking, we're open about six days of the week. So anywhere between 60 and 80 patients a week. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. Do you have questions, baby? Uh, No. Okay. So we've uh, really both been in awe of the Abdemonia Center's work. We've just been like all over your website. Um, Can you tell (laughs) us about how the center came to be? Well, thank you. Um, I myself, is, I'm often in awe of the team um, that we've created and the work that we've been able to do thus far. And it's been an excellent journey and I'm enjoying the ride. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see where to start. Um, I guess the, in, the, in the beginning, I've always knew I wanted to be a physician. Um, in college, I became a birth doula as a way to earn some additional cash. And that gave me a whole new perspective on pregnancy, labor, and the delivery process. Um, I loved the experience. However, I still believed that I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and it turns out I love the children, but I wasn't so crazy about their parents. And (laughs) that relationship ended quickly, um, after my pediatrician rotation. Um, and immediately afterwards I started my OB-GYN rotation and within a few days I fell in love. Um, I guess you could say it was my rebound relationship. Um, (laughs) 
And I lived in Cuba and Haiti for about a total of eight years, um, six in Cuba and two in Haiti. Um, and it was in both of these places that I learned a lot more about alternative medicine, such as acupuncture and herbal mm-hmm. therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I returned to the U.S., I was super jazzed about bringing the knowledge and the experiences that I had um, to my newfound, like my newfound passion to my patients. However, there was just no space and no place for it in the U.S. healthcare system. Mm-hmm. So I continued trying to find a place that I could fit in or where my knowledge or my experience could fit. However, it was constantly like trying to fit a square into a circular, circular hole. It just, it just wasn't happening. Um, so at the time I was living in Pennsylvania and I was becoming frustrated. Um, so I assumed that I just needed to relocate somewhere that it was more, a more progressive environment, um, somewhere that it was like a um, more open-minded area where I wouldn't have to, you know, try so hard to do the work that I knew was of value. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started looking for a job in D.C. And in the process of looking for a job in D.C., um, I was offered a job working as the women's health consultant to the Surgeon General. Um, I loved that job. I loved it. I still love talking about it. It was a great job, fantastic job, awesome job, amazing job. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I loved every aspect of it. Yes, go ahead. Which Surgeon General was that? Uh, the U.S. Surgeon General at the time, it was Dr. Murphy. Okay, right on. Um, and in, however, when the administration changed, um, my job starkly changed immediately and I could see the handwriting on the wall. Um, I won't go into the details, but it was obvious that I wasn't going to be able to do my job the way I had been with the level of clarity and smoothness and transparency and accountability, (laughs) insert all the words. Um, so I knew it was time to go. Um, but I also knew that I didn't want to go back to work in the same way I had been practicing before. Um, But I also needed some more education to practice the way I envisioned. So I went to school and I became a licensed acupuncturist um, and a clinical herbalist. And right after graduation, um, I immediately opened up the Abdemonia Center. Um, And like you mentioned, we are an integrative reproductive medicine and women's health practice. Um, We offer OB-GYN services. Um, everything from reproductive endocrinology and infertility, acupuncture, herbal therapy, nutrition counseling, health and wellness coaching. We have a yoga shred instructor. Um, <laughs> our yoga shred instructor was on tour with, um, no, in residency with Celine Dion. Um, and so she incorporates viola vibrational therapy into all of her um, courses and her workouts. Um, she also does spinal reset and restorative yin yoga. Um, Reiki, massage therapy, um, pelvic floor physical therapy, doula services, midwifery, and of course, vaginal steaming. Yay. <laughs> um, were you, uh, did you go to a medical school in Cuba? No, I did. I worked there part. I went to Johns Hopkins and I did my MD and PH, um, mm-hmm. but I also did some of my work in Cuba as well. Yes. Okay. I have a few friends who did that, uh, that medical program there, like that yes. if, if you go there, then it's free. And then when you come back, you have to work in a, a community of need for, I think it's three years. Yeah. yeah. And then that's, and it's almost at now, almost every community is a community of need right. because the healthcare <laughs> system is, I mean, people think, oh, you have to work somewhere rural or somewhere in an inner city. No, you could really work in Columbia and you'd still be in a community of need because mm-hmm. it's, the shortages in the healthcare system are still so real um, mm-hmm. because the system is broken in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so pretty much if you're working in healthcare anywhere at this point, you're in a community in need. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, thank you for giving us all that background. Yeah. That's so interesting. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I've uh, been really interested in going to Haiti re- uh, recently. Yeah. So hopefully we'll take a trip there soon. That's so that's so cool. And being from Miami, I, I just have a lot of love for both Cuba and Haiti. Mm-hmm. And so that made me really happy. I started, I, I knew I was in love with Cuba. And then I just, I fell in love with Haiti. The, right after the earthquake, they needed physicians. Mm-hmm. And so I wound up going there on medical mission. And it's just, you know, one of those things where like, just we, everything we see on TV is not, not what it's like in real life. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I was preparing myself for a picture that had been painted by Mm -hmm. our media, 
Um, and there were parts of that were true, but there was a bigger part, the people that were um, way more important. Um, the Pueblo in Cuba, but the actual people of the country were amazing. Um, and my experiences there, I, I mean, I still talk about it and people are like, you just, you talk about Cuba all the time. And I'm like, I, yeah, I do. Because <laughs> those are some of the most formidable years of my life in terms of just experiences professionally and personally. And I just, I met people that I'm like still friends with. Like, you know, my parents came to meet them and they, my parents asked about my Cuban and Haitian family and <laughs> it was, they were just amazing experiences. That's so dope. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about your team. The center has okay. a really intriguing team of clinic pr- practitioners, and you went a little bit into the different services that they provide. But how did you select those specific skill sets? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, far, go together. Mm-hmm. Um this is pr- Proverbs is pretty much the basis for how I went about selecting our team members. Um, I work well alone when I need to get something done. Um, but that's like an immediate kind of thing or I need to like, get a task done right away. Um, but as a center, we specialize in treating complex women's health challenges. And there's not one modality that's going to be able to do that with the level of efficiency and effectiveness that I desired. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not, there's not a pill, there's not a hormone, there's not a surgery that's just going to make most of these things disappear. Um, and that's the model of Western medicine. And I also know that doesn't work. Um, I love what I do, but I, I got it to a point that I didn't love how I was being able to do it with all the restrictions and, you know, and all my time, what I can and can't say, what I can and can't um, suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like one of the major drawback, the draws to our center is that we do not employ um, pharmaceutical interventions or drugs or hormones or surgical interventions um, because we believe in the healing power of our own bodies. Uh, we just have to remind our bodies of how we physiologically can heal ourselves. We were designed for our own, own healing. Um, and so when we work together, we work in concert um, to heal those conditions. And it's, again, we're helping our patients' bodies return to their equilibrium um, in their healthy, optimal, physiologically natural state. And they're, again, without a use of a pill, but actually using things that come from Mother Earth, um, seeds and berries and twigs and bark and Mm -hmm. um, roots and stems. And I give, you know, people that are the herbal form where they're like, this is look like stuff you got out of your backyard. And I'm like, well, most of it in some way, shape or form <laughs> is a derivative of the stuff that you have in your backyard. Mm-hmm. But it, it, for me, it just reemphasizes the connectedness that we do have with nature. Um, we were given those plants. We were given those berries. We were given all the parts of the plant um, to utilize to our benefit. Mm-hmm. And I feel it's just important to like utilize those things that we've been given um, instead of a lot of the synthetic things that we have no idea what they are. Um, and the side effects that they come with. Mm-hmm. And those synthetic medicines in the beginning were made to mimic what nature already gives us, but yes. just with a really a lot longer shelf life. And um, right. it's, it's supposed to and a lot work of really side fast. effect panels that are worse than the actual um, condition that you're facing in the first place. Absolutely. Um, every time I watch these commercials and I don't even watch a lot of TV and I see the, you know, drug commercials and it's like, oh, you see these women and men running through the forest and like playing, you know, these, all these wonderful things. And it's like, oh my gosh, they're living great. But meanwhile, in the back, you're hearing this man like speaking at mock speed. Right talking about like, oh, you're trying to get rid of your headaches, but he's talking about suicidal ideation right. and chronic, you know, bloody diarrhea. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, is the headache that bad? Right. Um, right. Trade off doesn't really sound like you're winning. <laughs> so, um, and that's the thing about herbal therapy. There's, um, you do need to be licensed um, so that you know the interactions of the drugs. It's not just something that you can just, you should take off the shelf. Um but you know how they interact with other, med- other medications. Um, and that's where the training comes in. And, and it is an art and a science. And that's mm-hmm. the other thing I like about it because there's beauty in the interaction. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dope. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask about, um, so this word, evdemology, evdemonia, sorry, evdemonia. <laughs> I'm uh, very new to it. Um, but, and it's like most actualized state, like, what is this? Can you explain this to me? Wow, I love that question. Um, and it's in our more actualized state, we have both male and female patients. It is a, we put reproductive medicine first for a reason. Um, reproductive doesn't necessarily mean that it's always a female factor issue. Um, in terms of infertility, it can be male factor, it can be female factor, or it can be both. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we emphasize that reproductive medicine is male and female inclusive. Um, and we have patients at all different stages of treatment. Um, we have patients who visit with us to get a treatment for massage um, or v steam just for health maintenance um, and self-care. Mm-hmm. Then we have another set of patients who have one of the aforementioned conditions and they are on an individualized tailored signature program. Um, and then we have, and they're usually with us between three to six months um, of, a, of a schedule that includes um, the services that are directly related to their needs and what they actually, um, the condition that they have. And then we have um, a set of patients and clients who practically live at the center um, as they're taking part in all the services. Like they're literally there all the time. I'm like, I think you're here more than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, they like multiple times a week, they come in there one week, they're coming in and get a steam and then they're like, you know, I should just stay and get a massage and, that's the beauty of it because it's like we're, we're also forming community. Mm-hmm. Um, people come in and they're like, okay, I made a massage appointment, but if you don't have one right back to back, I'll wait. Um, we have a beautiful space and it's like a living room when you come in. So, and there's beautiful like music playing in the background so, and there's coloring books on the table. So people are like, I'm just going to color my picture. I'll go back to the picture that I had like last time I was here <laughs> and I'll finish my picture. And they're literally can spend, practically all day at the center. Um, so that's, that's, that's just nice to be around um, because it becomes more than just a patient practitioner relationship. We're all seeing each other multiple times throughout the week. So it's um, very family-like. Um, and I've, we've just been blessed with just a wonderful space that affords the opportunity for us to help host events. Um, so most weekends there's something going on in the center as well. Um, like we had, I think two weeks ago, we had a bee steam party where we were just like literally like round robin steaming and everything was going on. It was, it was crazy amazing. Um, classes and workshops. Um, the week before, uh, the week before Valentine's day, um, having a, let's talk about sex workshop. Um, we have cooking demonstrations and even wine tasting. So there's just like, there's always something going on. So it's, Sometimes it's like a three ring circus of stuff, but every, every, every week it's organized chaos in terms of there's something for everyone every single day. Wow. That's really cool. That's amazing. And is the center where you, like, is this what you envisioned or do you have more things you want to add? Do you have ways you want to Well, I want to add a support groups. That's the, um, I think that's going to be the last thing I want to turn the doula um, services into a collective where the doulas actually kind of, they're a part of the center, but they pretty much run their, um, their own operation internally, but through the center, Mm -hmm. um, we're going to probably develop that a little bit more in, in the upcoming year. Um, and we, in 2020, we're also going to be off. We are going to bring on a, um, licensed social worker and counselor, and she's going to run our, um, support groups. So that's Amazing. gonna. That wasn't something that I was. It was something that I was looking forward to, mm-hmm. um, but I was like, okay, until I find someone that's like fits our, like fits in with our group, then it, <laughs> I wasn't rushing it because I want the person to vibe well with us, and mm-hmm. we're all nutty and crazy and wild, um, and you have to be able to like fit into that. Yeah. Um, but we're also you know crazy passionate about what we each do, um, in turn professionally, mm-hmm. um, and I think if we're all united around that passion. Everything else just falls into place. So in 2020, we'll be starting um, support groups. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So 
I know when I was in college, I had a bunch of different jobs. I waited tables and I worked at a record label and I did like hand-to-hand promotions and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I never considered being a birth doula like when I was 19. So how did you come to this work? Um, well, that's the thing. I was like, I, I've always wanted, I knew I wanted to be a physician. That part I knew I wanted to do, but I didn't, I again thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, but I think the intersection between my passion for health, education and women's empowerment, um, that's kind of how it all started. And I honestly didn't want to, I didn't think I wanted to be an ob because I was like, who wants to look at vaginas all day? Like <laughs> who signs up for that? Um, and I realized, um, that there's a lot more to it. <laughs> And whenever I say that, when they're met in the room, they're like, me, me. I mean, I, I could do that. Um, I just didn't seem like, like who signs up like willingly to like, and it's not just like the, you're seeing everything, like the good, the bad and the ugly, literally. It's yeah. not like, it's just not a walk in the park. And, <laughs> um, and I think also coupling with the fact that our current healthcare system is broken mm-hmm. and there are aspects that are stellar, but there are two very few people who have access to affordable adequate, acceptable, and appropriate care. And I was getting frustrated because I was seeing too many people who looked like me, a family member, a cousin, a friend, my mom, my grandma, my aunt. Um, And I'm like, what did they tell you when you went in? Who did you see? Like asking questions that were like, like, did you write that down? Like, what did they like, try, like, did that really happen kind of thing? Um, And in general, like hospitals and clinics are understaffed. Um, physicians are incentivized to actually spend less time with patients. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and that whole process like goes against my Hippocratic oath. It Mm -hmm. goes against everything that I, you know, first swore to do was do no harm. Um, and when I finally realized that I just could not work within a broken system, it was time to create a system that was in line with my personal ethics and my ethos and my morality and my personal interests and my passions. And I wanted to, and I still desire to transform how we take care of women. Mm-hmm. And by opening the center, now I feel like I'm part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. Okay. And what did always wanting to be a physician look like? Like you were just, you came out of the womb like, yeah, I'm going to take your job in 20 years. <laughs> Doctor. I'll, maybe not quite that <laughs> bold and, and abrasive, but um, yeah, I, <laughs> there were three things. And I mean, if you saw my baby pictures from zero till about five, um, I never had any clothes on. <laughs> um, and when I did, it was, I had like a t-shirt and there was either like a, some type of baby stuffed under my shirt. I wanted to be a mother. <laughs> um, and when I, someone like started getting me like doctor kits, I always had a stethoscope on. Um, and sometimes it was a combination of stethoscope and no clothes. Like it was one of the two. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be a physician and I wanted to be a wife. Um, my mom always jokes. She's like, your order was way off. Like it was never, <laughs> you we didn't raise you that way, but you're, order in terms of, cause I was like, I want to be a doctor first. I want to have kids and, you know, get married later on. And my mom was like, I don't know how she came up with that order. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how, that's not how we, that's not what we hope. But I was like, those are my passions. And, um, but yeah, if you literally look at my birth, um, my birth to about kindergarten, all pictures were some form of that. Like I knew I wanted to be a physician. Mm. I was always playing, I would play doctor on anything that would lay still long enough <laughs> for me to blood pressure, you know, fever checks, anything. But yeah, I, I think I, for, for the most part, I always wanted to be a physician. And everyone was like, well, what was your backup if that didn't work? I was like, I didn't have one. Mm-hmm. I did not have one. I love it. <laughs> um, did you have a question? Maybe? Yeah. I wanted to bring it back. Um, like you talked briefly about like, you know, the women in your family or, you know, people saying about their experiences when they went to the doctor and stuff. And you were just like, mm-hmm. they told you what? Um, what do you think is like the root cause of uh like the breakdown in, in protection for women or like just care for women um uh, in the healthcare system? Um wow, there's there's so many layers, but yeah. In general, um, it's a broken system that just doesn't honor its patients. And women are at a higher risk because we're by nature, by anatomy, physiology, and 
our distinct life cycles, we're just more vulnerable. Um, our current system is a disease management system rather than a healthcare system. Um, I think actually a healthcare system is a misnomer. Mm. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, um, the technology industry is continually driving up the cost of care. Mm -hmm. um, insurance premiums are outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, so when profit is the main goal, um, the quality care and the preventive care, the preventive, preventive medicine treatment modalities take a way, way, way far backseat. So um, consequently, there are therapies and modalities that cost, that cost more, like the things that we do at the center. They cost more, uh, which makes it even more challenging for patients to access the actual kind of care that they need um, versus the kind of care that is available to them based on their socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. their geographic location, mm -hmm. financial resources, and insurance coverage. Um, the trickle-down effect um, that incentivizes Shorter appointments is also to blame. Um, as physicians, we're not trained to treat women with dignity and respect. Um, many physician-patient relationships and interactions with women, they're all, um, women are disregarded as being emotional or turfing it off as, oh, um, so some level of emotionality is involved. Um, and you may know, but the word hysterectomy um, is based on hysteria mm -hmm. right. and a woman being hysterical. Right. Um, and so that was precisely how they treated her being too emotional um, was by removing her uterus. And while we don't use that same terminology, the spirit of the matter is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, just to kick, take it out. You have a hormone issues, menopause. So okay. Just, you know, t take out your uterus, get a, you've got fibroid, just, just take out your uterus or, you know, just get a hysterectomy and then everything will be okay. Um, when actually every your that uterus, even though you're way past your childbearing years or have no desire, there's some hormones in there that you still need. Um, and that brain body connection, it was designed for a purpose. Like we do it designed, it's a cycle. It's a, you know, machine that works and it may need tweaking, but just taking it out or tamping it or shutting it off medically is not the answer. Um, in addition, we often, women often, we relinquish our power to medical professionals out of fear mm -hmm. and lack of education about our rights. Mm -hmm. um, a woman is allowed to say that she disagrees with her proposed treatment course. Um, she should be encouraged to ask questions and obtain a second opinion. Um, she can request that terminology be repeated or instructions be said slower. Um, but oftentimes we hesitate to do that because we don't want to be seen as a problem or an issue or causing, you know, a doctor more work. Um, and being an active participant and letting things be thoroughly explained to you um, in, in her own health care in comparison to, in, to her own research um, is important. I think a lot of times most women are not placed in an empowered role, so they don't make these decisions or take these actions in terms of advocating for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really in-depth answer, yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit about steaming. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so... You said that you guys offer steaming at the center. How long yes. have you been offering it and how were you introduced to it? Did you see it first in Haiti or Cuba? Uh, I was actually, that's one of the things I was actually doing for myself. My mom, um, we've been, we've been steaming since I got my first menstrual cycle. Nice. Um, that was one of the um, rites of passage, I guess. And when I was that age, I was like, what are we doing? Huh? <laughs> Why are we doing this? Like I didn't, I was one of those girls. I was a jock. I was an athlete. I loved my sports. Um, I was a little bit of a tomboy. Maybe sometimes I still am, but I bounced it out a little bit more. <laughs> but I was like, this, <laughs> I was like this whole period thing and wearing a bra and like all this stuff that I like, what, what, who, who designed this? Um, at the time my boobs weren't even that big. And I was like, I don't really, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> I don't need this. Um, you guys created this sponsor. I never had any clothes on before. And now you want to like put all these like, <laughs> lip things. You tell me what is, what is this about? Um, and I like, I took it as like a personal attack on like my athletic life. Like this is going to slow me down. This is going to interfere with things. I'm not going to be able to like have the level of freedom. I don't want my period to slow me down. 
I don't want to hear about a cramp. Um, and I've been <laughs> blessed that I have had, like, I still tell people all the time, I have the best beard in the world. It comes like clockwork. I've never, I never miss no clotting, no pain, no cramps. I am actually like it because it's the one time during the month that I'm like, okay, chill out and like mm-hmm. slow yourself down and you have an excuse, um, or I have an excuse. Um, but I was an early adopter, um, personally to steaming just based on my family. Mm-hmm. Um, when I got to Cuba and Haiti, a lot of women were steaming in, um, a lot of different ways. And again, when I got back here, I just knew it was something that I wanted to do. Um, and it was definitely one of the first services I knew I wanted to have at the center. I wanted us to be able to host it. Um, and there's nobody in the area who, in our immediate area, who offers it as a service. So um, mm-hmm. it was a no-brainer in terms of incorporating it into our host of services. Mm-hmm. Right on. Um, have you had a chance to read the fourth trimester vaginal seam study? Oh, yes. Yeah. I loved it. It was wonderful. <laughs> Yay. Um, can you share any first thoughts you had? Was there anything that was surprising that you read in there or? Um, not, there was, I think the I was one just jazzed about having an evidence-based study that was conducted and was done because a lot of times when you, we look at treatment modalities, if there's no evidence-based research, if there's no double blind, randomized clinical trial done, mm-hmm it might as well be done in your kitchen um, with Ray Ray and them. Mm-hmm. And my thing is that's not exactly how it works because again, something like acupuncture, it there is no way to have a, you know, randomized clinical trial that is going to yield you the results because every it's so individualized and it's mm-hmm. so personalized. Mm-hmm. Um, so there isn't going to be a set of points that I can give to everybody and say, yep, this is how it works because that's not how you can have one disease and it manifests 20 different ways. Right. Um, you're not going to treat it the same way. Um, like we have, you know, here we, you have a headache, you take Tylenol um, and makes your headache go away. It doesn't work that way with um, complementary medicine. Mm-hmm. It's definitely more tailored. It's more personal. Um, and so I was, again, just excited about there being an evidence-based study that addressed the clinical findings that are part of the postpartum period. Um, and they haven't been examined in the way that I read. Um, and so our fourth trimester postpartum program is just another way that we introduce vaginal steaming as one of our services to our patients um, as part of their postpartum, re- postpartum recovery regimen. Um, during this time, women are usually so preoccupied with breastfeeding mm-hmm. because there's so much push on breastfeeding, they immediately shift to sustaining their little one um, and literally forget about their own self-care and their own aspect of healing. Um, so we've expanded the application of these um, findings to support our patients who have either experienced a pregnancy interruption, whether it be post-abortive, stillborn, or post-miscarriage. Um, because I think a lot of times we think, oh, full-term baby. Um, yeah, that's postpartum. But depending on where a woman is, um, in her pregnancy, there's a serious interruption that can wreak havoc on a woman's mind, body, and spirit, um, mm-hmm. because that cascade of hormones is still chugging along and still going, mm-hmm. and it doesn't just stop because the pregnancy stops. It's still trying to like it ramps up even more because it's mm-hmm. like something's going on. We must not be doing enough, so it kind of ramps up and it like can throw things off. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So the study was very important in terms of seeing real numbers and real stats um, in terms of what steaming can do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you just said so many wonderful things. (laughs) Um, I work as an intuitive healer and I always tell people like, it's amazing that we all have like a head, a trunk, (laughs) two arms and two legs, because we just look so different from each other. Like the way that we're constructed is so different. And any, I, um, have a vaginal steaming practice. And anytime I'm sort of like looking at someone's constitution to understand what they need on all levels and which herbs they need to use and which mantras they need to use or whatever, like it's never, there's never a standard, really. No. There just never is a standard. Because we're not standard. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, the body parts are the same, but 
kind of. And I would tell people all the time, okay, I, if I stood 10 women up here, point to me the which one that has picos, point to me the one that has fibroids, point to me the woman that has is suffering from infertility, point to me the one that has, and like, that's an impossible task. Mm-hmm. You, you, you cannot look at someone and say like, okay, yeah, she's definitely um, has fibromyalgia mm-hmm. or it, it just doesn't happen. And then I could put that another 10 and they all have polycystic ovarian syndrome and they look nothing alike. You're like, they have nothing in common. And I'm like, yeah, they do have one thing in common. They all have PICAs. Um, and it just, and I treat every single one of them. That's what they came in here for, but their treatment course is going to be completely different, mm-hmm. completely mm-hmm. different. I mean, yeah. even acupuncture wise, like I'm not yeah. even using the same points or, you know, it's, it's just, it's wildly different. Like nothing overlaps, nothing mm-hmm. overlaps. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's beautiful because it makes it art and mm-hmm. not just science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it kind of, it just makes it more and more clear, like why the system we have now doesn't work. Why it doesn't work. Like it just, you can't, we're not a one size fits all type of world. Not at all. Yeah. Um, so what do you think then are the implications of the study for where we're going in the future? Like what the trajectory of reproductive health care is for this country? Because we, I don't think we can sustain what we have much longer. Without a doubt, vaginal steaming has a positive impact on many of the indicators of postpartum recovery, um, particularly in the areas that you highlighted in the study, um, blood pressure uterine restoration, um, waste, I think waste girth, weight mm-hmm. loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember all the things like labia healing. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the, uh, succession of uterine bleeding. Mm-hmm. Um, Lokia, yeah, yeah, Lokia, future discomfort, mm-hmm. bowel regularity, all those things like hemorrhoid reduction, like all those things that like steaming is going to have a positive in- impact. Um, and there are other things that have nothing to even do with like the actual steaming of the perineum, the actual steaming of the vaginal area. Um, especially when we consider like breastfeeding, like if you're breastfeeding, it's going to help you with milk supply. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are like, how does that even work? I'm like, it's all connected. Like the mind, the body is all connected. So um, circulation, I think there's yeah. the, the, it's way far, far more reaching than we even know. Um, and I think that's why the value of that study was like just amazing because it just shed some light on so many different things. Um, and even things that we don't even always connect with pregnancy in general, um, like incontinence and, um, urination, but like things of that, things of that nature that we're like not always thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, all these, all the findings were like so promising and compelling. And I believe at the very least it will give practitioner pause, practitioners pause in terms of um, how we go about treating women um, who are postpartum, um, who are in their postpartum recovery period, and practitioners like myself and others who are practicing in a similar way. Um, we're the pioneers. We are the early adopters um, of this of traditional medicine. Um, we're leading the charge and providing the services. However, it's the patients who wield the true power because they're the ones who are going to demonstrate to the system that there's a need for this service, Mm -hmm. um, that we have to have it. Like there's a real, it's in demand. Um, and this is how the system changes. So it's from the inside out and from the bottom up. And once our patients start making demands on the system, that's how the system will capitulate to what we already know to be true. Mm -hmm. I have a, another, uh, question. One of the things that we um, came across in formulating the study is that there is no definition or standard for postpartum recovery. Like there's not even an agreed upon set of like things to check for. So the variables that were used in the study were agreed upon by just like some moms and a midwife and like, what did you deal with? Okay, I dealt with that too. Let's put that on the list. So I'm interested right. to know if the Evdemonia Center has a definition that you guys use and a, a set of things that you check for. Um, in terms of 
the definition that I use is from the moment of delivery until two years out. Um, and I think a lot of times, like two years, I had another baby by then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and about that. <laughs> there was that preconceptional time that you also need about two years for your body to replenish the nutrients. Because if you're also nursing, that time is steady being pushed back. Um, because your body and people are like, oh, post, you know, postpartum, that's that four to six weeks after. I was like, that's when postpartum, the postpartum period starts because you still have a, your body is still going to be going a lot of, undergoing a lot of different other changes. So um, in general, we use a two-year period. Um, and again, a lot of times that two-year period never comes to full fruition in terms of full restoration. Mm -hmm. um, I can say it's rare that it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, you know, going back to work and breastfeeding and all the other different things that come into play. Mm -hmm. um, when a woman should just truly be nurturing herself and healing and feeding her baby. Mm -hmm. um, another part is that we don't have give women enough time to do that before they're required or maybe necessary for them to go back to work. So that's another thing that interrupts that postpartum recovery period is going back to jobs that definitely don't um, offer the woman space, not just physically, but the literal space to heal um, and the figurative place to heal her physically, spiritually, mentally, all of the above before she's plugging back into full-time work status. Um, but in general, I there's a checklist that we go through, but as a physician of Western medicine, I don't necessarily like have it written down and say, check, check, check. They're just things that I go through in terms of, okay, when you left the hospital, talk to me about how your delivery was. Talk to me how I know, where did you deliver? How did you deliver? Was there an episiotomy? Things of that nature that the more intrusive their delivery was, the more things I'm going to check. Um, what shape were you in before you got pregnant? What was your pre-pregnancy status? Mm -hmm. What was your pregnancy course like? Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of talking, um, unlike we do in Western medicine. Um, and being able to follow a woman from the time she's pregnant to delivery it gives me a greater sense of not just what her postpartum recovery is going to be like, but some of the things that we can try to prevent so that she doesn't have to go through them during postpartum um, recovery, because there can be treatments and things that, again, in complementary medicine um, that we can offer that can cut some of those things off at the past. Um, and you don't have to have a ne negative experience in your postpartum recovery. It can be a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for answering that. I know that was a little bit of a curveball question. Oh, no worries. No worries. Okay. Um, so that was all the questions that we wrote down. Did you have any other clarifying or follow-up questions? No, no. I just can't wait to look at this video again and learn some more. <laughs> just start digging in. Okay. Yeah. So we have the good doctor, <laughs> Lorena White mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she has the Evdemonia Center in uh, Maryland, Columbia, Maryland. Yes. And uh, so, yeah. So what they do there is, <laughs> is you know, they help women and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> um, and, and reproductive stuff and stuff, you know. <laughs> but uh, no. So just a, a, bit, a, a bit of history on the good Dr. White. She came out in the womb swinging the uh, stethoscope. She stole the one from her actual doctor and, uh, and swung it at him and said, uh, this is going to be mine one day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, went through life uh, treating her friends and family members as a young naked baby. Um, <laughs> uh, found her way on the good islands of Cuba and uh, Haiti after Johns Hopkins. And uh, and was just like, Western medicine. Western medicine is awful, so I'm going to fix it. <laughs> and so, yeah, she uh, she formed this uh, this collective uh, with with a bunch of amazing people, and set out to really uh, take care of of the real issues that that what Western medicine doesn't really address in terms of like 
actual digging in and actual uh, caring for patients and not just, you know, taking them through the system or whatever. So, yeah, um, that's what I learned. And we good. And that's it. All right, cool. I like it. I like it. I like your version. <laughs> And I, well, I, like, I like the coming out swinging part. That was nice. That was a nice ad. I think I'll use that in my next version of how I should relay that story. <laughs> update the bio. Right. Yeah, I'm going to update my bio, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, baby. That was fabulous. That was awful. <laughs> um, Lorena, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks to you both. This was great. I had a good time. And thank you for the invitation. We did too. It was an honor. It was a great time. I can't wait to watch this tape back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Could you tell our listeners and our our watchers how to find you? Is the Evdemonia Center on social media? Can you tell the website? Yeah. The Evdemonia Center, um, it's E-U, even though it's pronounced E-B, but it's E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-A Center. We're on Instagram as the Epidemonia Center. Um, we're on Facebook as the Epidemonia Center. Um, our website is my name, www.lorenawhite.com. And, but if you like Google search the Epidemonia Center, it'll come up. And, and we're on Twitter at um, Epidemonism. And it's E-U underscore D-A-I-M-O-N-I-S-M. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you both. Have a wonderful day. All right, you too. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Hot and Steamy Podcast. Feedback is gold, so please like, comment, share, and subscribe. This podcast was made possible by our sponsors, Kelly Garza of Steamy Chick and Kimberly Ann Johnson of MAGA Mamas. Visit our website for more information on them and our other guests, to view extras, and to purchase merch. That's www.hotsteamypodcast.com. www.hotsteamypodcast.com.